So we're going to uh, read from Acts today again. And please stand for the reading of the word. <clears throat> Acts 9 and 19b. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God, all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among all the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samar Sa Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. That's the word of the Lord. You may be seated. For over three decades, author Salman Rushdie has lived under the threat of death since the Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa against him for writing a novel called The Satanic Verses, which Muslim adherents perceived as blasphemous. Now, a fatwa is a ruling on a point of Islamic law given by a recognized authority. In this case, the Ayatollah said that Rush Rushdie must die because of his blasphemy. He went into hiding to avoid death threats and several assassination attempts, uh, living, looking over his shoulder since 1989 when the fatwa was first decreed. Two weeks ago, a young Muslim fanatic finalized the fatwa when he stabbed Rushdie 10 times as the author was about to give a lecture in New York. It's got to be tough living under the threat of death, constantly in suspense for something you've done or something you believe in. Though Rushdie was persecuted for his fiction, the newly converted Saul, later known as the Apostle Paul, was threatened because of the truth, the truth of Jesus Christ. So after an amazing supernatural encounter we talked about a couple of weeks ago on the Damascus Road with the Savior, Jesus laid out Saul's future. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. You know what? Keeping you in suspense as my computer froze. Well, look at that. That hasn't happened in a while. Good thing I come prepared, huh? I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. We begin to see the prophecy start taking place in Saul's life. This exact prophecy. And this should inspire us to fight for the truth of the Savior and to also consider the cost of following him. The first verse, Acts 9, 19. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. It is amazing what God does in the soul of a person who has truly given his life to Christ. Here, immediately, we see Saul hanging out with the very people he was persecuting before. Saul was once the enemy of these disciples. Now he's brother Saul. In a little mission church in New Zealand, 
a line of worshipers knelt at the altar rail to receive the Lord's Supper. Suddenly from among them, a young native arose and returned to his pew. Some minutes later, he returned to his place at the rail. Afterwards, one of his friends asked what happened. The young man explained, when I went forward and knelt, I found myself side by side with a man who killed my father and whom I had vowed to kill. I couldn't partake of the Lord's Supper with him, so I returned to my pew. As I sat there, I thought about Jesus' statement at the first Lord's Supper. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I remembered the Lord Jesus hanging from the cross and remember he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's when I returned to the altar rail. One pastor said, what a tremendous experience it must have been for this former predator of the wolf tribe of Benjamin to sit down with the sheep. That's an, crazy, that's an incredible transformation. Killer Saul is now worshiping with those he persecuted. Verse 20, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. R.C. Sproul said, just minutes before his conversion, all that Paul could think of is what he could do to Christ. But immediately after, all he could think of is what he could do for Christ, which reveals the essence of his radical conversion. Now, there were probably 20 or 30 synagogues in Damascus. Paul went to them first, and what did he preach? What did he preach? That Jesus is the Son of God. We must remember that Jesus is not a son like a human father and son. This is an analogy, in essence, to reflect that Jesus is God in human form, conceived in the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit. So that's why he's God's son. Luke 135 says, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. This is the most important fact that any non-Christian should know. This is the most important fact that any Christian should know. Jesus is fully God and fully man. The second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God and three persons. And I could spend month after month explaining how that could be, and I could never fully explain it because it's a mystery. There are tomes written about one God and three persons, and how can that be? And you know what? There's no way you can explain it. It's a God thing. But Jesus said the following, I and the Father are one, in John 10, 30. The Father is in me, and I in the Father, John 10, 38. And anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus himself said this, and there's multitudes of verses that where he also said that. It's important to understand that Jesus has to be God. Why? Because only God can forgive sin. Even doubting Thomas, when he realized who Jesus was, said, my Lord and my God. Can you say that? Can you say Jesus is my Lord and my God, your Lord and your God, right? Next week, as Tom is going to talk a little bit about that, if indeed he is your Lord and your God, what is required of you? Of course, Saul didn't use those verses to prove that Jesus was God. He used the Old Testament to do so. Most likely starting from Genesis, where Jesus is the one who would crush the serpent's head, to Malachi, where he's the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. Let me ask you, do you know your Bible enough to share about Jesus from the Old Testament. What if a Jewish person conversed with you, found out you were a Christian and wants to know why you believe? What would you say? You can't use the New Testament. You'd have to use the Old Testament. I'll bet you could. That's what I have here. You can start, well, remember this, go to Isaiah 53, and all you have to do is just read that slowly to him, and he'll understand exactly who the author is talking about. Now, Paul couldn't help preaching Jesus. He would later write, I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. 
I'm going on vacation next week, but it's a working vacation because I get to go work with an international ministry called Way of the Master where I get to teach uh, people who are paying 500 bucks to come to California to learn to evangelize. <laughs> you guys get to learn for free. You know that? Free. So I must, I'm compelled to preach. I love to teach people how to share the faith, and that's why I'm going there next week, and I'm really looking forward to that. Let me ask you, is that your sentiment? Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. God has saved your soul from hell. He's changed your life. How could any of us remain silent? Everyone should be boldly proclaiming the truth of our Savior because he's done great things. Has he done great things in your life? Has he done great things? One or two things, right? Just one or two things? He's done immeasurably incredible things in our lives. I am amazed. I am amazed. Just to be saved is enough, right? Everything else, everything else is his grace. John G. Butler said, if we are not going to preach Christ, we need to shut up and sit down, for we have no message of worth for the souls of men. Many churches, therefore, ought to close their doors and stop masquerading as churches, for they do not preach Christ. Rather, they discredit him and deny him. Have you ever gone for a physical and to have the doctor look at your tongue? Right? Stick out your tongue, say, ah. Christians, too, occasionally ought to have a tongue check to see if they are speaking of the Savior. Acts 9, 21 to 22. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Of course they're astonished. He once was a violent persecutor of Christ, but now he's a rabid preacher of Christ. That's what happens when one is born again. You all know the phrase born again, right? Jesus says you cannot see the kingdom of heaven unless you've been born again. He said that to a Jew, Nicodemus, who came to him at night. Unless your life has changed radically by putting faith in the Savior, are you sure you are a Christian? Have you given your life fully to Christ and is your life reflecting what he's done in you? There was a man who was a terrible alcoholic who everyone called Old Bill. One night, Old Bill stumbled into a rescue mission and heard the gospel preached, gave his life to Jesus, and became a different man. His entire life was changed and was so obvious to all that people stopped calling him Old Bill. Instead, they referred to him as New Bill. One of my favorite verses is 2 Corinthians 5.17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That's the New Living Transi Translation. But the old is gone. The new has come. And it's reflected by how we live our lives amongst others. This is the radical change that Saul encountered. By his own words, he said, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Man, he was patient with me. I know he was patient with Rick. And long-suffering with Joe, who just turned an unmentionable age. And he's patient with every single one of us as he continues to sanctify us. Make us, we are saints, but we're becoming more saintly. Now, there are more than 300 passages of the Old Testament that speak of Israel's Messiah. No doubt Paul used those to baffle the Jews to prove that Jesus was their Messiah why is that important? Well, Messiah means anointed one or chosen one. In English, we use the word Christ. He was the chosen one who would redeem Israel from their sin by dying on a cross and being resurrected to new life. 
being resurrected to new life. Verses 23 and 20 through 25. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Now Luke, the author of Acts, minimizes time when he writes, after many days had gone by. This was actually three years in Arabia where Saul was being trained for ministry. You won't know that unless you're actually studying the passages. After many days, you think, oh, a week or two has gone by. But in Galatians 1, he explains in his testimony what happened. He says, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. Well, that may not seem like such a big deal, but if you're reading just the book of Acts as it is, without studying it, you're just thinking, man, Paul just became this super apostle just like that, and God put him to work, and he's out there doing this. No, he, like everybody else, needs to be trained. Needs to be trained. What happened was Saul wore out his welcome in Damascus. He went to Arabia for three years, then came back to Damascus, but the Jews would have none of it. They wanted to kill him for his message about Jesus. If you want to see an effective person for the gospel, see how people resist him and persecute him. Playwright George Bernard Shaw said that the greatest compliment you can pay an author is to burn his books. So if you're getting persecuted for your faith, you're doing something right. How ironic that the man who breathed out murderous threats now has a fatwa on his own life. The one who made others suffering suffer is now suffering himself. His enemies were watching the city gates, but not the city walls. So Saul escaped as a basket case. So much for evangelizing his own people, huh? How humiliating, huh? You get saved, you're witnessing, you're doing everything right, and then now you're getting persecuted and you have to be lowered in a basket? Verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. So Saul then thought it was a good idea to get together with other believers, but that didn't work. He's getting threatened. He's getting, almost getting killed. He goes, well, I'll get some comfort with the disciples. They don't believe he's really a disciple. Even after three years away, his reputation preceded him, his former reputation. They all thought he was a spy, a wolf in sheep's clothing, a mole, a sham. This was just his latest ploy to infiltrate and arrest them, they thought. They didn't trust him at all that his conversion was real. <laughs> at this point, most believers would probably give up on Jesus and say, it just isn't worth it. Look, Lord, I gave my life to you, and this is how you treat me? I'm preaching your name and doing what you say, and this is how I'm repaid? Every new Christian will have a crisis point in their walk to test if their faith is sincere. Mark my words. That's what I warned, that's what I warned you about, right? Royal? And it came, huh? You're ready. That's right. Did you come to Jesus thinking he was a heavenly sugar daddy who was going to give you everything you ever wanted in this life? Did you even count the cost beforehand? Did you not believe Jesus when he said, you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. How many people will hate you because of Jesus? Everyone. Eventually, now, if they don't know you're a Christian and you aren't speaking about Jesus, they're going to like you. They may even love you. But when you talk about Jesus being the only way, that's when the test comes. Jesus was not joking when he said they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. 
In Acts 14, the believers understood the call when they concluded this. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. How many of you have encountered many hardships as a believer? Raise your hand. Only a few? Well, Lord, I pray that you would put big hardship on all the rest of them so they know how faithful you are. What a blessing prayer, huh? No, we all have. We all have. If you didn't understand it then, understand it now. The general life of a Christian is adversity, disappointment, trials, difficulties, and betrayals. But Jesus is with us. Jesus is with us. Quite a difference from the health and wealth gospel, isn't it? You're not going to get that here. The reality is, if I prepare you now for when those trials come, you're not going to say, I didn't know. The reason I'm still walking is because my pastor was faithful in preaching the full truth of the gospel and telling that this life is not all there is. Your best life now is not now. If your best life is now, your next life is hell. No wonder so many say so little about Jesus. We are more afraid of rolling eyes and negative comments than the praise from our Savior. Understand this. If you want to be used by God, you must go through it. Thank the Lord that he knows what we need. Despite all of Saul's difficulties as a new believer, he pressed on, and God provided someone who could encourage him during these tough times. Verses 27 through 28. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Who knows what the name Barnabas means? Yeah, that's right, son of encouragement. Everyone needs Everyone needs somebody sometime who can help them through the mess. Barnabas did this for Saul. Jackie Robinson was the first black man to play Major League Baseball. While breaking baseball's color barrier, he faced cheering crowds in every stadium. While playing one day in his home stadium in Brooklyn, Brooklyn he committed an error. His own fans began to ridicule him. He stood at second base, humiliated while the fans jeered. Then shortstop Pee Wee Reese came over and stood next to him. He put his arm around Jackie Robinson and faced the crowd. The fans grew quiet. Robinson later said that because of him putting his shoulder around him, that saved his career. Now, encouraged by Barnabas, Paul was able to continue his evangelism, preaching freely. Verses 29 through 30. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. He was courageous enough to speak with the Greek-speaking Jews, the Hellenistic Jews. This is all kind of technical, but we're going through the book of Acts so you understand everything that's going on. But the Greek-speaking Jews are the same ones who killed Stephen. And they tried to kill Paul too. And remember, Paul was there when Stephen was getting stoned by these men. But his own church family whisked him off to safety, back to Tarsus, his hometown. You know how long he stayed in his hometown of Tarsus? Ten more years. Ten more years. Think about this. The first 14 years of Saul's life were lived in relative obscurity. But God was training him for future ministry. After that time, Barnabas would get him to help in preaching Christ throughout the land. But he would go as Barnabas' assistant, not as a big leader. So even when Paul, when Barnabas goes to get Saul, he's the apostle Paul, but he's not the big apostle Paul. He's an assistant. Saul was ready to be used by God only after he came back broken humbled, and humiliated. A.W. Tozer says, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. 
And Alan Radpath said, when God wants to do an impossible task, he takes an impossible man and crushes him. Later in his life, after the Apostle Paul was used by God for many years, he wrote this to fellow believers and to us as well. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. No matter what you're going through, no matter what God has called you to, as difficult as it may seem, and I don't know what's going on in everybody's life, but God is using this to prepare you so that you can be more effective for the gospel. He's going to carry it on until the day you die. He's never going to stop working. He's never going to stop working. He's always working. Even when we don't see it, he's working. Even when we don't feel it, he's working because he's a way maker, right? And he's going to continue to work. And if you have a Barnabas in your life, someone who can encourage you through the difficult times, what a blessing that is. I got to tell you, Bill and Beverly have been encouragements to me from the very get-go. From the very get-go. have always encouraged me and have been there for me. And many of you have, but man, Bill has just always been there. And I thank you, Bill, for being my Barnabas. Who's your Barnabas? Maybe you need, oh, it's great when your husband's your Barnabas. But it's great if you don't have a Barnabas, maybe you could be a Barnabas to somebody else and encourage them. What is it that you are currently encountering that is difficult, miserable, and impossible? God is teaching you to trust in him so that you will be effective for his service. Stay put, stay faithful, stay consistent. Last verse. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. This last verse summarizes all that has happened so far in Acts. Saul disappears for a while, and then the ministry switches back to Peter. We'll talk about him the next time. But notice that the church continues to increase due to the faithful people who continue to obey Jesus fearlessly, proclaiming the gospel and trusting in him to do what he has said. That's the work that we have. The work hasn't ended, has it? There's still many who don't know Jesus. I gave the gospel to someone yesterday, and this, well, it was a Blanco beauty queen, and she complained to two people on the float, and then she s- left me a nasty voicemail. She goes, don't push your religion on me. I believe what I believe. No one should tell me what I should believe. And I thought, wow, I guess I did something right. (laughs) But it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel that way. But nevertheless, that's what happens in a world where anything goes. But Jesus, one way, right? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you are faithful to us. Thank you that you have empowered us for works of ministry to preach your gospel in all the world, starting here in Johnson City. Thank you, Lord. There's a lot of work to do, and thank you that we aren't alone to do it. You're right here with us, and we have many workers in this church, Lord, and I'm very thankful for that. Help us to be bold and courageous. May all of us have the same sentiment as Paul who says, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. If only you would give us eyes to see the reality of heaven and hell and those who don't know you or pretend that they know you. Give us the words to say, wait, you already have. Thank you that you've given us the words to say. Thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. And thank you that someone came along that shared the gospel with us so that we might know you. Praise your name. We love you. Again, I pray this in your name. Amen.